So next steps in an ERP project. Uh, in the previous uh, lecture, we looked at the um, the start of this, and now we're going to look at the implementation, operation, and maintenance of an ERP project, and we'll get into the detail of it. So um, you can see on the right in the illustration the SAP ERP system in the center there, and there are some add-on modules like supply chain management custom relationship management, product lifecycle management and supplier relationship management that are part of what's called SAP Business Suite. Um, and then around that core there are people with roles who um, uh, are managed through human capital management which is a, uh, the last module that we do in the lab in uh, ERPS. So. Uh, the stages of implementation, operation and maintenance uh, are installation and configuration, customization and interfacing, testing and training, change management, the implementation of SAP ERP, in which we're taking that as the, the system that we look at, although uh, we, do, we do that because it's the market leader, but um, you know, there are lots of systems that you could em employ. Uh, we'll look at go live operation and maintenance and then upgrading and replacement so this is what we're going to cover in the next module uh, right now so the first step is to look at implementation the elements of an ERP rollout uh, what does that consist of so here we've got the implementation cycle um, so implementation, operation and maintenance, generally there's an upgrade uh, of most systems between five and seven years uh, from when they first put the system in. And on the right hand side here you can see the ASAP implementation cycle, which consists of project preparation, blueprinting, realization, final preparation and go live and support. So if you look at the bottom there you can see that the project is a project start. Um, and then before the next section of blueprinting, there's a project kickoff. So generally with an ERP um, project, it's such a big project that you will have a project kickoff meeting to get everybody together to, to say this is what we're going to achieve, this is what the outcomes are, uh, this is what it means if we're successful, that kind of thing. So project preparation is about planning the project, setting up implementation standards and procedures, executing uh, with a kickoff meeting uh, system setup might be um, the pro uh, production hardware installation at that point um, quality checks and project preparation in the blueprinting phase we'll be looking at defining a system environment gathering business requirements so deciding what the system's got to do collect configuration needs uh, so how, if we put this system in, how will we configure it? Prepare, issue a, a, a change log. Um, as, so that's, that's something that you will kind of logs what you're doing during the whole project. Document, um, training, and then come up with a testing plan as well. So not only have you got to train the employees, but you've also got to actually test out and have a formal procedure for testing out all the hardware and software that's going to be installed. The realization phase is about validating the uh, configuration that you're going, you've chosen, um, checking that the business processes now work in the new format, um, looking at any changes that have happened, um, so the changes in requirements that might have happened, um, conduct organizational change management planning for the production support and cutover. So cutover is where you start to think about going over to the new system from the old one. Run integration and acceptance testing, uh, plan the end user training, and then you have a review of how well did this go. Um, in the final preparation phase, you refine your cutover plans. And this is these are the plans that you have to make sure that everything's gonna go very well when you go to go live, which is when you actually say to the um, employees and the customer you know this is ready for prime time now you you're going to be able to start using the system productively 
you establish a long-term support plan you train the end users and administrators um, you might do to do that by training uh, super users or you might uh, tra train the trainer and have them go through the different parts of the organization doing training in in the same mode um, create and, and staff a help desk um, manage the system and have people who will do that execute cutover uh, when you're ready at the end of that that phase uh, final preparation and um, then there's the start of production uh, the, the system goes live so after go live monitor the live environment uh, make sure that it is working okay um, close any open issues that might be happening uh, start lo a long-term plan um, support plan look at quality checks um, and then go to go live and effectively from the project's point of view but not really the organizations that's the end of the project so you can look at um, implementation at that link I've given you at the bottom there uh, so the extent of customization uh, the project scope resources devoted to the project um, pretty much that's kind of defined within the project and um, so on the right hand side you've got an illustration from uh, the IBM site uh, for solutions and IBM has one of the largest SAP practices for consultancy and implementation of SAP systems so uh, and they have also are providing even more close co collaboration by providing global data centers for the running of SAP HANA um, so SAP HANA is a um, an in-memory database that allows things to go very quickly um, so uh, if, if, you, if you want to actually search for a record it will bring that that uh, query back in, in a few seconds which allows you to do real-time business intelligence gathering on the system so there's quite a quite a relationship now between IBM and SAP uh, so you will be the, the duration of the project is going to depend on how much customization you do um, what's the scope of the project how much resources are devoted to it the size and complexity of the organization involved and how good the implementation team are so implementation is is done um, in stages so roughly in percentage terms the time spent on each would be project preparation about 11 percent business bl blueprinting about 14 percent actually realizing the project as, as you expect um, about 50 percent um, and then final preparation before go live 19 percent and then after that you'll have go live and support of about six percent that will taper off so let's look at the installation stage of implementation so what is installation well it's the mechanics of changing software versions or a new package um, successful installation doesn't net ensure successful implementation so you can quite easily s successfully install the software have it perfectly running and then nobody wants to work with it um, because they haven't been trained or they haven't um, you know they, they don't value its um, interventions that it's made uh, there hasn't been any project management or change management to bring people along with it so you have a problem there if, if you if you have that situation if you've allowed that situation to happen it may not achieve the company goals over a period uh, well it should do if, if the requirements have been gathered for what the system should do uh, it should should work um, and this was brought home um, pretty much at Nestle uh, so Nestle did a project in the USA and, and they decided to um, bring all their companies and they've grown by acquisition in the USA with about 20 different companies or sorry that uh, quite a few companies um, to the extent where they had uh, you know Nestle and uh, ch chocolate making involves vanilla in a big way so they had all these different companies who were buying vanilla uh, as a key ingredient which is quite expensive um, under lots of different part numbers um, they were paying lots of different prices there was no um, 
economies of scale that they should have been achieving because they were buying quite a lot of it. Um, so that was the first thing. You know, Nestle uh, they decided to have a, a an ERP system that would bring all those uh, problems into one area where that was all rolled up and they could manage it properly. Um, and I'd just like to say that you know they had later went on to have one Nestle, a project called One Nestle. Uh, where they uh, spent 200 million dollars rolling that system out to the rest of the world having spent 200 million dollars again in the USA working out how to do it what was what would work so you could say that the project in America would cost 200 million dollars it was very expensive but on the other hand if it meant that the rest of the world could be served by the same system then it was a good investment so uh, Nestle started their implementation as pretty much as an installation project, putting in the software. They thought it would be based on best practice; everything would be working, and and the staff would go along with it, and everything would be fine. But that wasn't the case, and they actually had to restart the project with a change agent on board. Um, so, a change agent is a kind of super project manager who um, has an understanding of everybody's kind of like desires and wants, and is able to uh, through partly through the force of their personality um, but also you know their knowledge and you know their unequivocal knowledge on the subject uh, they they are able to bring people along and get them used to um, working uh, with the new system so that's their role uh, so Nestle found that they needed the change agent and uh, it was only later uh, when they tried the other route of installation only that they realized change management was needed um, so they learned from the hard way pretty much but it, uh, but as it as it was a kind of staged introduction it, it really didn't impact the whole company so installation starts with a development instance of software so you, you might set up a sandbox version of the software to allow configuration choices and development um, you might have different instances of ERP, um, and um, what you want to do in the sandbox version is work out what what is it that you really need, and you know test out the requirements, that kind of thing. Um, ERP experts say the central instance should be the root ch chosen, so you have one central ERP instance, and that that does work very well. Um, Otherwise, you may end up with having a second uh, business process re-engineering project in the future. Well, that may not be a bad thing if you're kind of restricting the number of um, you restrict the project scope to a certain extent, um, and then you'll be successful in delivering it. Uh, the worst thing you can do is to allow the scope to kind of like keep creeping along with new things being added, um, the deadlines being you know going out. Um, and eventually you find that you've got uh, you know a difficult project to, to handle um, so configuration inputs uh, companies policies and settings they all need to be put into the software and customization actually modifies the software and processes so uh, that's good because it works a little bit better towards what you want but on the other hand customization has to be put in every time you upgrade the software so it makes it more of a nightmarish situation when you want to actually go and upgrade to the latest version of ERP software. So there's a balance between customization and you know configuring and keeping it more standard as the code is standard. Uh, so the installation process. So you create a host computing environment. So it might be a computing cluster as you see bottom right, or just an ordinary data center. Uh, in the, the diagram in the center you'll have a SAP application layer, there'll be a database, um, there'll be operating systems that are working, there's a disk subsystem layer, server layer, and a data server, uh, data center layer. Um, all of those are built into, you can, you can buy these in pre-made racks that are just wheeled into place in an air-conditioned um, data center room, either in your premise or with a, a third-party provider and uh, third party providing I'm sure will become the norm as, as time goes on. So you create the host computing environment 
um, you may choose to uh, buy this uh, at, uh, this um, facility in uh, the outputs from this uh, data center room of computers uh, as software as a service. Uh, you can do that with SAP through buying uh, SAP Business by Design, which is designed to run an SAP data center. You configure it by a series of checkboxes of modules you want, and then you um, decide when you want it, and you pay the subscription, and that gives you all that you need. Um, but if you don't do that, if you if you put it in your own data center on premise, then you you you're going about it the same way. It's just that there are different people in, involved in maintaining it. Uh, so you can outsource installation. So on the right hand side here in the gr in the light green square or rectangle there's the, there's a company and it's focusing on its core competencies. It's pretty pretty good at um, making widgets and so it focuses on widgets and it doesn't uh, it outsources all this IT support stuff that um, uh, is needed to actually do that. So servers and uh, routers and switches and all that kind of thing. Um, they're all kind of outsourced um, so that's one way of doing it so on the left hand side you see key partners in what's called the SAP application service provision model uh, so SAP provides the applications and, and then there are data centers that provide the um, hardware and software and then there are also uh, different uh, it says the various big four and other implementers that could be SAP it could be Oracle um, it could be HP uh, there are lots of different options there so if you're going for an application service provision implementation uh, these are the considerations um, you may want to have a pre-configured solution that you're adopting uh, you'll do a scoping phase to discover what the client needs in terms of application software, hardware and the, how it's going to be delivered, whether it's going to come in the cloud or whether it's going to be, uh, in this case, application service provision is in a remote data center but for a longer period. Um, or you might do a software as a service with a price of each user per month uh, based on what the client needs. Uh, for small to mid-sized clients um, or you might um, do a turnkey solution of ERP, supply chain management, e-business all, all wrapped up into one. You can save yourself quite a bit of money if you if you are going to put the uh, hardware in you know you're going to outsource it to a third party something in the region of 17% uh, over five years so it's a reasonable saving. For smaller companies. Uh, so installing the infrastructure. So on the left hand side here you've got a tiered network so at the bottom you've got the database server uh, and that's linked to an application server via a couple of resilient switches and then that server is linked to the web through another couple of switches and through a firewall and sometimes you have double firewalls so, so uh, at the point of the application server you might have a second firewall before that um, just to um, add some protection uh, so there's a multi-tiered nature of modern ERP uh, web-based systems um, which you kind of see in the diagram there and, uh, and there is rack infrastructure that you can roll these um, uh, servers and um, disk storage elements into a, um, a space, couple it up to electricity and um, you know data, and then you're away really. Um, so it's po quite possible and much much easier to do these days with a modular infrastructure than it has been in the past. You've got to be careful that uh, the hardware can process the number of transactions that the company needs to make a profit. Uh, so in the case of Fox Mayer, which is the fourth largest drug company in the USA, it went broke over about a period of four years because it tried to have a, a an automation um, process for its warehouses and it told the staff in the warehouses that it was doing this, which is rather a shame because they wrecked about $34 million worth of inventory as a result. Um, but they also 
um, brought in SAP ERP at the same time and then they won a very large contract and what they thought they'd bought in terms of how many transactions per hour the system could do was now dwarfed by the need for even more transactions per hour which they then couldn't realize uh, so it's important to do a, a an accurate sizing process so you know to work out how many saps supported that, that you've got um, just to define what a sap is one sap is defined as 20 fully business processed order line items per hour so um, if you're processing an order line then um, you, know, you could do 20 per hour in one sap uh, so if you think about how many transactions you can get done um, in a system which has got uh, 10 uh, CPUs in it um, that works out at 34,590 um, saps for a system with 10 CPUs. Um, if you multiply that by 20, you, you're over half a million um, business process ordered uh, order line items per hour. So it's qu quite a, a big difference between having, depending on how many CPUs you have in the server. Uh, you will also be looking at um, the applications that span between the portal infrastructure, the web application server and the exchange infrastructure. And this refers to my SAP, which is the forerunner to ERP. Uh, in the right hand diagram, you can see in the left part of it, that's the primary data center. And on the right, you've got a backup data center. So in the data centers, you've got uh, servers running different app uh, SAP applications. They're linked to schedulers and uh, storage devices and um, routers. Um, so you can uh, connect one to the other via a wireless network if you wanted to. Um, there are lots of ways of, of making ensuring resiliency, which is what you're trying to achieve here. So we try to engineer out faults uh, how, that could bring down the whole system. So we have duplicate switches, duplicate paths through switches and routers, uh, duplicate power supplies, duplicate data network cards. Um, we, we basically try and cut down the, the single point of failure. We prevent that. So a single point of failure is SPOF. Uh, so to mitigate that, we can have hot pluggable disk drives for resiliency in a RAID format, for example. Uh, redundant power supplies, redundant fans. So when I say redundant, I mean there are duplicates of each of those. So if one goes down, you've still got the other one. Um, you can have even um, more RAM than you need and uh, redundant CPUs and duplicate disk array controllers and redundant network interface cards uh, to try to minimize the single point of failure. And you can do that at a greater scale because in addition to what I've just talked about, you can also uh, have duplicate servers. So um, one server is kind of mirroring the other one and uh, if one goes down, then the other one can take over. And you can have duplicate clusters. So you can have clusters of servers um, with high speed network links between them. And when I say network links, I mean um, Thunderbolt con connections or fiber optic connections so that things transfer over very quickly. Um, and you can have cluster failover, so you can fail over from one cluster to another one. Um, and so that can be quite powerful too. It enables you to uh, avoid a problem where the system will go down because one particular part of it isn't working. Now you've got to decide which storage systems, databases, uh, servers are going to be used. And in this comparison, HP came out better than IBM and Sun. Sun is now part, part of Oracle. Um, so, uh, but they're, they're still the big players. Um, and the reason why that is, is that you've kind of looked at, you've scored each of those vendors against those criteria so things like system support 
and um, and then you've given a rating and the higher the rating then the, the more likely you are to go to, with that vendor in this case HP um, the losses from unplanned downtime this is what you've got to guard against you, you can wrap, ramp up some uh, losses very quickly so if you've got an average of unplanned outages per year of 13 roughly the average duration per outage is 4.02 hours uh, the average revenue loss per hour of unplanned outages is $160,000 then every time you have an outage it's costing you $640,000 the average annual revenue loss uh, might then be, work out to be $8.4 million, which is quite a big amount. So if you can avoid that, then all to the good. You can also decide how often and by, you know, what consistency of uptime your system is going to have. And if you pay a certain amount, you can have an uptime of 99.9%. .9%, so your system is available for that percentage time. You may feel that that's not enough. So if you pay three times as much as that, you can have even more resiliency in the system. It will give you 99.99% .99 reliability uptime. Notice that if you spend, if you try to go to 99.999%, which is you know, ridiculous, ridiculously um, rigorous in terms of uh, quality uh, insurance you're going to pay 12 times as much so this exponential rise in this law of diminishing returns um, which is what that is being shown there uh, it does make quite a lot lot of difference in terms of cost uh, on the right hand diagram you can see that to go from 99.9% to 99.999% is there only a difference of 47 minutes of uptime whereas if you go between 99.9 and 99.99 that's a 473 minutes of delta uptime so that might be worth it for some companies but it's few companies it, it would be worth it to go 12 times the cost uh, as you see there you'll have redundant power supplies you'll have uninterruptible power supplies that d provide power even when the mains is not working um, in my mini data center at home I have an uninterruptible power supply for each of the PCs um, so if the mains fails you've still got battery power I think it's a good investment for the, the hardware so to make sure that it isn't continually cycling on and off um, so uh, redundant power supplies is important uh, you'll need to cool the data center wherever your thing is I've been stunned by how long it's taken for any sort of water-cooled servers to come into being, but you can radically alter the economics and also the efficiency and greenness of data centers by using water to cool processes. Um, I'm sure in, in the fullness of time, water, -cooled, um, water cooling will be the thing, but not the moment. So you've got best practices for the layout of the racks um, to allow proper airflow in and um, access to the different systems within a data center with a raised floor jet typically okay so um, I'm going to look at the configuration stage of implementation so you set this involves setting up the software uh, configuration adds all the policies and settings a firm uses um, it might be the examples of that might be whether to use last in first out or first in first out for inventory and accounting so if it's last in first out then um, you're using the most recently acquired stock which may have come at a lower price if, if prices are falling uh, to you know feed production and the, the impact that that will make compared to if you use first in first out in those circumstances where previously the stock was more expensive is that you will reduce the amount of cost that the accounts are based on and therefore the profit will be higher so you would typically go to last in first out if you were just about to do a big accounts review it's a way of making the company look better than it is actually um, so that, that's one thing to think about um, 
So you might uh, also reckon, recognize revenue by geographic unit or product or channel. Uh, you might need to think about what legal entities or generally accepted accounting practices we follow in total, what the default currency used by the system will be, or typically ERP systems will allow you to have multiple currencies and it will just do the roll up for you. Um, so that's quite good. That's one of the good reasons for having a, an ERP system. Uh, Dell took a, a year to define all the configuration of its SAP system before it actually did any implementation at all. Um, so that was very sensible because they were they were working out what they needed to do to have a, a fully configurated system. So I would say that's best practice. Um, comp competition between vendors has seen configuration options multiply. Well, certainly that's the case, but only. Um, if you're a savvy CIO within a company, then you know all about um, maintaining uh, the system and um, how much configuration you want to do and keeping it down on costs. Um, so you might want to do customization of software, but again, as I say, uh, a non-vanilla approach does complicate up complicate upgrades in the future. two types of customization you can add extra fields or add a step to a process this is what's called enhancement um, so that's the first thing um, but you if you, you might want to make a modification to the code and um, so if you do that to add that extra functionality then you're basically customizing it and making it your own bit of software again which has problems if when you come to an upgrade so if you do lots of customization, only about 25% standard configuration, then that's one way of doing it. The implementation time goes up if you're doing that to between six and nine months or more. Um, if you're doing a shrink-wrapped shrink implementation, then mostly it's a standard configuration, pretty much as it came out from the vendor, with only 25% customization required or done. Um, so you might choose that if you're a smaller company um, and then in between you've got half and half, 50%, 50%. Uh, so it's kind of balanced between those two extremes. So third party software vendors offer bolt-ons. This is not customization. These are kind of like pre-made options to add it functionality, which if you take them up uh, can be enacted. Uh, pretty much the SAP Business Suite comes with lots of options that are disabled and you can enable them at any time. Um, so enhancement packs and that kind of thing. Uh, other things that cause delay, um, unrealistic expectations of uh, how quickly it's going to go when you don't have change management in place, uh, to, you know, proper change management. Time taken over business process design activities and plans, lack of resources due to different goals of the company and the vendor. So uh, you might find that you haven't got enough support at the top and that needs to be dealt with really. Uh, customization bugs and delays, additional testing required. E ERP vendors won't support the code they didn't provide. So that's typical if you've customized their software, they don't want to know, they don't want to um, support any problem. And they might look at uh, the warranty and um, you won't have a warranty if you've customized the software too much. Um, so you might have uh, non-documented custom procedures which make the testing more difficult uh, than they would be if you st stuck to the kind of standard configuration. So at the testing stage of implementation, there are five types of testing Unit testing, uh, which involves single process steps or a functional spec check test. So that's where you're doing little bits at a time to check that each bit works. Integration testing, you're trying to find out whether the system um, works ac across modules and across areas. So does it work when it's integrated with one with other modules? Um, you'll do some real scenarios in terms of what it would be like after go live and this customer will 
then decide whether they're going to accept the software or not or whether it needs more work you'll have security tests to make sure that the system's impregnable in terms of data hacking and that kind of thing or at least as best practice as it can be and performance load testing checking you know, the whole system out under uh, lots of different types of load in terms of data you also might have parallel running in a conference room to allow uh, easy handover and testing of the system so here's a parallel running opportunity you've got that table on the left hand side there it's got uh, computers on either side so you might choose to do similar functions in the new system on the left hand side and, and the old system on the right hand side um, to uh, and then one of each, one person per two computers would then do their day job with the old system and then they would come to the new room and do their um, testing um, in that room so parallel running is an important element uh, you will then have to document everything that happens with the system so um, there would be a team of people who would actually be doing no th nothing other than documenting what happens next um, so that's another part of it you've got to consider it's very important um, then you will have a readiness assessment so this is where you decide um, yeah what's ready for go live so it might be the data center area is ready um, we've done a risk analysis we are ready in terms of disaster recovery uh, lots of things like that um, they have to be thought about before go live and then you'll do business process testing and you may be able to automate that but generally it will employ employees to go through and uh, test that you might backfill the positions while they're doing it um, drawbacks to this manual testing is it's time consuming um, you have to have this facility to um, physical facility to test it out you might have multiple client devices uh, the users involved may make an error um, so lots of reasons why you would be looking for something else and that something else might be ECAT um, so computer aided testing uh, so you have a set of servers set up and a, a room where you can send a, a live instance to some terminals and the user can use them um, so automated testing can cope with most systems generally it's been been updated uh, numerous times and it's now fairly flexible across different vendors of software and hardware so think about managing change uh, we may want to bring in a project like this um, and we may well it's a natural reaction to deny the change and decide we, we don't want anything to do with it um, but after a while you may still be resisting it but then it comes a point where you're thinking well okay uh, this change is coming in I can either accept it reject it or think about it more and if you do accept it then you can generate some much better productivity uh, so that's where the change agent is important in getting people to come along this path and take the risk etc and end up with something better so change management um, in terms of defining organizational changes involves defining the objectives of change stating the business case for it identifying those who will be involved with it defining the schedule of events that will result uh, from change uh, lists specific steps involved in implementing the change uh, defines the results confirming each step success or failure identifies risks and potential points of failure in the change incorporates mechanics me uh, sorry mechanic mechanisms for f feedback and plans for a continuous improvement after go live as and everything's sorted out so a number of skills you need to understand how to navigate organizational politics to influence positive results be able to deconstruct an organizational process and put it together in new ways that make it more efficient be a keen organ uh, analyzer who can clearly and persuasively defend their analysis to the firm speak many organizational languages such as sales finance it and manufacturing i've got i've got my um, linkedin that i speak the cornish language which of course is english but in a a broad dialect um, and similarly sales finance IT and manufacturing it's a similar thing 
For you understand the financial impacts of change either through business process re-engineering or business process improvement or management. And just a note there to say that cha the change agent at Nestle made a massive difference to the Im impact of that project. So, uh, change management principles. There are 10 principles behind successful change management and they are there so if you want to pause the video and just have a kind of like note those down then might be a good time to do it i won't read them all out um so just pause the video and then you'll be able to have a look and so now to welcome you back um we're going to look at uh, using consultants so how you might use consultants on the left here is you might use them to make some use um, SAP uh, NetWeaver the ability to make composite applications to link devices to the base level ERP systems and legacy systems as well to display that data in a fixed format um, which has been defined uh, with all these devices like mobile devices or um, uh, different mobile um, or fixed uh, computers. So there are the benefits and risks of consultants. Uh, they can be unbiased and objective, but on the other hand, if they are biased, uh, they could be, um, you know, they can give non-optimal decisions, tr favoring one vendor over another when that wasn't appropriate. So there are some benefits and some risks that you need to think about and uh, just compare the, the two sides and again I'll leave you to pause the video and uh, just have a look at those and compare them because that's quite a good thing to do and so now we're back and looking at the methodologies of implementation so methodologies so you might have a phased approach this is slower deployment in one area like Nestle did before they went and rolled one this layout to the whole world um, so it's a rollout uh, by functionality by module in a specific division or region um, the good thing about that is that um, you aren't going to have any big surprises overnight um, the problem is that the rollout goes on longer and staff to get start to get change fatigue uh, they start to think well will this project ever end and get really fatigued uh, by the continual change um, on the other hand it's a lot less risky than going the big bang approach which comes from direct cutover so this is where you say right at a certain date there's going to be complete leaving of the old system behind and going over to the new system this is called direct cutover or you know big bang approach to change um, it can be good for small to medium sized companies but if you were doing it in a large company, then you are effectively, inverted commas, betting the company on the change, which is something that um, Fox Mayer's CEO said at one stage, we're betting the company on this working, and unfortunately his bet was wrong, and they went into liquidation uh, from having been the fourth largest drug company in the previous four years. Um, so uh, the problem with direct cutover is that projects can be rushed you can have pe people that overlook important details. Um, staff get a feeling of panic because they've got to do so much in such a short period of time. Um, there's better re uh, return on investment um, if it's done right, but uh, obviously only if it can be done right with the right number of staff, etc. Then you've got um, here, I'm showing the business cutover stages. So you've got the first part, which is overall testing, then the ramp up phase for B, uh, get, get ready for cutover, then C, execute cutover, D, business uh, support happening, and then finally a steady state of cost, pretty much back to where you were before. There is There are ways of talking about these systems Completions before go live being one where it shows you the date and the fact that somebody is saying within your organization your technical support organization that is ready to go uh, sorry um, 
there are still things in red there that still have to be completed so obviously this project isn't ready to go at this point uh, you can look at where the new software will impact your parts of your business so uh, that's an important thing you can um, uh, monitor that particularly if you've got software like IBM's um, they have software to allow you to monitor uh, roll out and it will show you if you change this server what does that mean for the rest of the servers and, and your different ways of running um, so this is um, uh, something that you can use and it, uh, that's kind of software tracks what changes you've made so it's very easy to answer these questions uh, then you have uh, a process where you get all the various groups who are involved in going live and the management team to say yes we're going to go live and uh, once you've got that then, then you're free to go there's also a franchising approach uh, this is similar to the phased approach but it's for a holding company where the holding company has lots of disparate companies that don't really relate to each other uh, they just have acquired lots of dis disparate um, uh, systems uh, so franchising approach it's good for a company having lots of different business models of companies within the group um, the benefits of high level business intelligence are still possible that you would ha be able to do trend analysis on things um, so there are some differences there between that and the um, previous approach you can also have an on-demand approach using software as a service such as SAP business by design um, this is faster for implementation because you're not having to think about putting the servers in and all that redness redness testing that you would have had to have done it's done by the vendor um, like SAP um, it's upgrading is easy because it's performed by the vendor and the vendor doesn't allow any customization so that's what, how it keeps its cost down so there's a number of things that, that need to be thought about here and you in the age of cloud computing um, if you're right with the right vi vendor then you can um, prosper risks why do projects fail um, it's more about people failure to share the vision and rally the troops uh, projects can lurch to a halt or worse begin a slow and steady demise can have a subpar implementation inadequate training or layoffs during implementation so uh, if you might if you have contraction of the company and key people get laid off then that's obviously not good um, employees using workarounds sabotaging the systems accuracy once once an ERP system is not recording ad accurate data then your battles lost so you want to safeguard that really so here's an ERP approach to risk that you might have so there are various different types you can have turnkey software as a service implementation what are the risks of that um, you can have an allocate version the client owns the process and the consultants are improve, uh, involved as requested uh, so there are various different ways that you can do this in terms of risk comparison uh, there are various types of training so six keys to effective training uh, don't just teach how uh, to perform transactions uh, describe the transactions in the context of how they would have completed their roles uh, previously on the old system um, and pretty much that's a, a big thing refer processes back to how they would have been done in the past uh, use classroom training, lots of different methods, webinars, hand-on, hands-on simulations, screencasting. Use a blend of formal and informal training tools, etc. Um, create super users who can train others. Um, make sure they know the internal processes. So they're fairly comprehensive in their knowledge. Allow plenty of time for ERP implementation training. So don't, you know, think you're going to install it in uh, six months' time and then suddenly it's going to be ready in a month's time and you've only got two weeks to get the training in this is not going to work you're not going to get it done in time um, have well-defined responsibilities and change activities for various people in the project rollout team that's important 
So training, uh, you would have uh, developer training on the software running in the sandbox. You'd have technical training again in the sandbox and you'd have end user training on a parallel running uh, suite within a small room or boardroom while the implementation is going on. So you might th choose to train people using SAP certifications or however you think would be right or what the consultant recommends. Uh, training and preparation. Training for who? Uh, well, you're training uh, various people who are involved with the TSO initially. Um, so, also, and the idea is to come up with cookbooks and recipes of user guides that people can use when they need to find out information once they've gone live and they need backup. So, I have a training timeline for when training is going to happen. Uh, and um, that's very important. Different types of training at different points. Uh, operation and maintenance. Pretty much we're going to get into the last bit now. So in the operation and maintenance part, um, you would have focus on stable operation, patches, fixes, enhancements, and updates. Um, so that's what we got to focus on there. Uh, ERP maintenance and support. Um, there are some ways to cut costs, negotiate lower software license fees, particularly if you've got, you're taking more software from them, you can try and get a lower license fee or a lower maintenance fee. Limit cut software customization during ERP implementation. Uh, explore third party support and maintenance options, so maybe cheaper than what you can do. Negotiate lower ongoing professional service rates. Um, again, if you're doing more work with them, then the rates can be lower. Quantify your total direct, indirect maintenance and support costs. That's important to be putting in the project. So, managing system modifications, you have a change release policy, a uh, procedure. So, a notification of change to everybody saying that these are changes are necessary. So, uh, we've been through these different routes and this is what we're going to implement. You also would have some project phases and you can see them there pilot projects typically we do a lot of those in the business school then development training testing and they're not sequential they're in parallel upgrading systems during operation and maintenance so you can upgrade erp systems um, they give you a competitive advantage um, so it might be that you, that would be one reason to do it. Uh, Globalisation, featuring assisted data flows, making global operations easier, that's another reason to do it. Integration of data, uh, use of best practices and cost reductions, all of that is good in terms of what you want. Uh, reasons why companies don't upgrade their systems include in, insufficient features of their system, uh, uncertain about the software quality, too many customizations have been made, that's quite a big one. Um, budget cash flow issues, uh, where well you can't afford to have the new system, and the upgrade process is too long or too hard. Uh, hopefully uh, vendors, for example SAP with its enhancement packs makes that a little bit easier. So that's the end of this session. Uh, we've been looking at planning, scoping, designing and implementing ERP projects and that last part was really about the implementation and installation. So um, thank you very much and we'll talk again. Thank you.